if you believe that thinking is a necessary precursor to learning, and if thinking is something that you want to improve at in your classroom, it turns out that there are things that you can do that actually make that happen. What I love about the Building Thinking Classrooms framework is that there's not just these 14 tools, there are also these micro moves that are all attached behind the scenes that we can keep working on. You are listening to a conversation between Judy Larson and Peter Lilliedahl about his Building Thinking Classrooms framework and related nuances. This is uh, Dr. Peter Lilliedahl. I'm a professor at Simon Fraser University and the author of uh, Building Thinking Classrooms. And I'm here with Judy Larson, who is a professor at the University of Fraser Valley. We, we thought that this would be a more interesting way for the listener to engage with thinking classrooms than to have just my voice talking my way through this, which, which exists in other mediums and in other platforms already. So I thought I would invite Judy to uh, be my co-creator of this event because Judy is probably the person on this planet that knows just as much about thinking classrooms as I do. She's attended numerous, numerous workshops with me. She's been in my classroom. And Judy is the one who pushes me to articulate uh, the research and my ideas around thinking classrooms in ways that I think makes it more consumable for, for the listener. So welcome, Judy. Thank you. That is an incredible introduction, Dr. Peter Lilliedahl, and you've been very inspirational in my own journey of becoming a teacher who uh, notices things in the classroom um, that I would otherwise not be noticing. So your work has been very impactful, not only for myself, but for a lot of other people. So we're here today to talk a little bit more about building thinking classrooms and the work that you've done and to dig deeper into some of the issues that come up and that we hear uh, questions about at, at various professional development opportunities. So why don't we start off with talking about what Thinking Classrooms is and where it came from. Okay, so uh, many of you, many, many people have heard this story. Um, I'm not going to go over that story again, but I, I'm going to say just this, that Thinking Classrooms is, a, is my reaction, is it, it is a reaction to the realization that what is happening in a lot of classrooms, uh, or what I observed happening in a lot of classrooms, was a lot of activity, a lot of really passionate teachers moving through content, but a, a real dearth of, of student thinking. And when I, when I say that, what I mean is, I would observe classrooms and there would be an absence of thinking the kind of thinking that we know students need to be doing in order to be successful at future grades. And my curiosity around what it would take to start creating, injecting, and fostering the kind of thinking that, that I was looking for in, in classrooms. And thinking classrooms is the result of the research in and around that idea. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you've uh, published and spoken about thinking classrooms in many places. So what are some of the places someone can go to hear that story that you were just referring to? Um, there is, uh, there was the Global Math Department uh, recording, which exists on their website as well as on YouTube. There's a link to it from my website, peterlilliadol.com. There's also a number of publications by myself that can be accessed through my website as well as a number of graduate students who have done their theses uh, and research on Thinking Classrooms, also which can be accessed through my website. There's also the Making Math... Making Math Moments That Matter. Episode number 21, actually, with Kyle Pierce and John Orr, who did an excellent interview with you as well. Yes. Um, and that one, that one doesn't go so much into the, the baseline story, but it, it does go more into... Um, where who I am and where I come from as a, as a math educator. But it, it exists out there. It, it's not hard to find. If you start on my website, you can go from there. You can also start accessing some of this through Twitter, uh, through Thinking Classrooms, hashtag Thinking Classrooms, through me at PG Lilliadol, or hashtag BMPS. All of these places are, are places where conversations are happening around this. So you mentioned Twitter. There's a lot of activity on Twitter, and I've watched Building Thinking Classrooms work blow up over the last, what, three to five years or so. I think I saw one of your first presentations. It didn't really have the name yet, and eventually you started naming it Building Thinking Classrooms. 
So where did that name come from and why do you think it's stuck? So at first, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my research was really focused around what are the pedagogical moves that teachers could make that can create more thinking in the classroom. So the, this notion of a thinking classroom had a very particular meaning for me, although the term is very general in its own right. But for me, what I was trying to look for was what, what does a classroom look like when students are thinking individually and thinking together collaboratively? And, and that thinking is a kind of thinking that we know students need to be doing. So I, I'm not talking about mimicking. I'm not talking about routines. I'm not talking about fluency. What I'm talking about is, is a kind of thinking students do when they're problem solving in essence. Um, so, so my focus was on trying to create these spaces where that kind of thinking was happening. And that's what I define as a thinking classroom. But the word that gets overlooked in that title more so than any other, I think, is a building. The building thinking classrooms, that active, the verb, the idea that there actually exists a set of pedagogical tools that teachers can pick up and start doing that will create the kind of thinking that I'm talking about. And, and so this, this notion that it wasn't just that I was researching thinking classrooms. I wasn't. I was researching what it takes to build a thinking classroom. So the, the title really came from that, the building thinking classrooms. Why it's stuck, you know, this, th th these things are hard to know. I can say that in all the workshops that I do, if I start talking about that students aren't thinking a lot, I get a lot of teachers nodding. And if I talk about the fact that we want them to think, I get even more nodding. And if I talk about that they need to think in order to be successful in, in future math classes, they not, there's even more nodding. So I think one of the reasons it's stuck is because there is this, although unspoken, there is, I think, this general knowledge within the field that this is a thing, this, we need to get the students thinking. And I think people agree with that in general. And I think the reason it's stuck is because people are recognizing first that there might be a need for that in their own classroom. And second, that when they try some of these things, it actually helps them move in that direction. We've seen many examples on Twitter of um, teachers posting various examples of, of the framework, of, of implementation in the framework. And so it's become very popular if you search the hashtag thinking classroom or hashtag thinking classrooms, or even hashtag VNPS or VRG. Teachers are really taking this up. So why do you think it's become so popular? And also, what are some of the tools that are really coming out in what teachers are trying? Why do you think they gravitate towards trying those first? So first of all, what's really interesting to me is that, so I do about between 100, well, about 100 workshops a year. The fact that teachers in those workshops are trying it isn't that surprising to me because they get to experience it. And Judy, you've been in like 20 or 30 yeah. <laughs> of my workshops and you see this too, yeah. that teachers walk out of the room and they have some specific tools that they can use and some specific tasks that they can try and they can go away and they can try it in their classroom. And, and I think this has a huge impact on, uh, on them as teachers when they are able to try it and they're able to experience the, stu the students thinking at their own hands. So that doesn't surprise me. What always surprises me is when someone is tweeting about this <laughs> and, and, I, and they're showing videos or they're showing photos and from the photos of the videos and from the text, I can detect that they're, they're doing this with fidelity. It isn't that they're just throwing out the hashtag, that they're actually engaging with this, with building thinking classroom in a way that the research and my publication of the research has indicated is the way to do it. So that always surprises me, that sort of ripple effect and that arm's length enactment uh, by teachers. So what that means to me is that building thinking classrooms isn't just something that, that teachers pick up by attending a workshop by me. It can be they can pick it up through, through Twitter. And we, we have cases of that. Yeah, you know, we, sure. We've tracked down and, and interviewed people who who have engaged with it solely through Twitter and, and have learned it. Which has been amazing. <laughs> yeah. And then there's also people who maybe attended a workshop with me and then have themselves given a workshop. And then there's that ripple effect. So I think that means that building thinking classroom isn't an idea that is rooted solely in me or in my personality or 
or in the way I teach, but it's, it has that transferable skill, not just ability to transfer from teacher to teacher, but also from workshop facilitator to workshop facilitator. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the popularity and the, and, and the way it has spread. I also think it has to do with some of the initial practices that teachers pick up. So the Building Thinking Classroom research was first focused on emerging practices that, can, that, that have more of an impact on creating student thinking than other practices. Once we had those practices, the research shifted to being focused on well, where do we start as a teacher? So as a teacher who has never done this before, where do we start? And, and also for a class of students who have never experienced such a thing, where do we start so that it's not overwhelming for them? And I think the fact that the, the three practices that we start with always are really engaging tasks, highly engaging tasks, visibly random groups and vertical non-permanent surfaces, those three things are all relatively easy to implement and they're highly impactful. So I think that's one of the other reasons that it's easy for teachers to pick this up because those are not burdensome practices. They're different, they're very different, and they can be frightening because it, it really does break the norms of what a classroom looks like, but it's accessible. And I think that has something to do with it as well. Yes, so for listeners who are just starting out, um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about these three basic tools and what they mean and how you implement them? Okay, so um, so part I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Part of this research was motivated by the realization that almost all classrooms look the same. I, I was visiting classrooms, and part of this research really was motivated by the fact that I sat in 40 different classrooms in 40 different schools, and everywhere I went, classrooms looked more alike than they looked different, and practices looked more alike than, and they, than they looked different. And everywhere I went, I saw this um, students not thinking. So I, I had this theory that maybe the only way to get students to think is to break through some of these classroom norms that I was seeing everywhere, these institutional norms. And, um, and so that's how the research started, was really focused on what are things we can do in our classroom that are radically different from what normally happens in a classroom and, and to what degree does that uh, create more thinking in the space? And what emerged as probably the m most radical departure from a, uh, a, a mm -hmm. typical classroom was the idea that, and not the idea, but the realization that when we had students standing, they were more engaged than the, when they were sitting. Mm -hmm. And when we had those students who were standing uh, working on whiteboards, blackboards, windows, any, any surface that was posted vertically on the walls and was easy to erase, they, there was more thinking and engagement than when we had them working on paper. And when we, when we took those students who were standing and working in, on these vertical erasable surfaces and we put them into groups, and not just any groups, but into random groups of three, that we got even more thinking and more engagement. So these first three practices are the first one being uh, highly engaging tasks and Twitter and MitBoss is full of, of candidates for this. So there, there's no problem finding those. And the second tool was putting the students into visibly random groups, which means that we're not going to strategically group them. We're not gonna leave grouping up to them. We're just going to randomly assign them into groups of three and then we put them on a vertical erasable surface. We call them vertical non-permanent surfaces. And those are the three practices. And together they make a really radical departure from what we see in a typical classroom. And we also see way more thinking, way more engagement, uh, and, and a whole bunch of positive byproducts come out of that. Nice. So if someone's been implementing for a while with these three basic practices, what do they try next? What's their challenge? Right. So, so that's only the first toolkit. That's the first three practices. There's four, four toolkits in the Thinking Classroom Framework. There's 14 practices Ooh. scattered between these, <laughs> yeah, these four toolkits. Um, the second toolkit, um, and, and I should say that that first toolkit, although it feels really strange for the teacher and really different for the teacher to enact this in their practice, it, it turns out it really has very little to do with the teacher mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. It's... And I believe that those ended up being the three practices that came up uh, to be the ones that we need to start with. 
not because those are the ones that move and change teachers, but because those are the ones that move and change students. Mm. Those practices actually kickstart students thinking. Right. Um, the next toolkit is much more about refinement of practice for the teacher. This is where we start thinking about how, how we can give the tasks verbally rather than textually, which turns out to have a, a massive impact on student yeah. thinking. Um, how we can rearrange the furniture in our room so that the students feel safe to think. How we start to think about answering questions that students ask. And, and, and this is an important practice to consider because whereas building thinking classrooms is a lot about how, the practices we need to do to to create thinking in the spaces, there's also a whole bunch of things we have to be really careful not to do because because this is a delicate space. Mm -hmm. And how we answer questions is, is very important in this regard because if we answer all of their questions, we're actually shutting down thinking. But at the same time, the questions are still coming at us. So we have to think about how we're going to answer those. Uh, we have to start thinking about how we're going to have students moving from the group work to the individual work and, mm -hmm. and, and what that looks like and, and that transition into what is often seen as or ter coined as practice exercises or homework, none of which turned out to be useful metaphors in the thinking classroom, but how we, how we make that transition. And, and um, also how we start to uh, foster student autonomy within this space. Nice. So let's say someone's been using this uh, daily for a little while. What sort of effects have you been seeing? So in general, what we see is, well, uh, I, I, I can come back to some of the data. So when I first started doing this research, I gathered a bunch of baseline data on how much thinking we were actually seeing in, in, in a typical classroom. And in a typical classroom, what you would see is that about 20% of the students, this is between five and eight students in the room, would do the kind of mathematical thinking that, that I was looking for for around eight minutes in a one hour lesson. The rest of the students would do zero <laughs> minutes of thinking. Wow. Yeah, so um, nowhere to go but up. Um, what we're seeing now, and, and before I go on to that, so this, this is a problem, mm -hmm. right? When, when there's that little thinking happening within a one hour lesson. And, and why is it a problem? Because thinking is a necessary precursor to learning. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if the students aren't thinking, they're not learning. It's it's a necessary precursor and we need to have students thinking in order for ha to have them learn. Um, once a person has been up and running and, and implementing the building thinking classroom framework, even if they haven't gotten all the way through to the fourth pro uh, toolkit yet. But if they are implementing the first three toolkits, what we're seeing in the data is 27 out of 29 students are thinking wow. for between 50 and 55 minutes of a 60 minute lesson. And the other, the last few students are still thinking for more than eight minutes, but they're more sort of gliding in and out of the thinking. Um, massive improvement. So that's, that's the main thing that we see. And that's the right. main thing we look for. There's a bunch of other byproducts that are emerging as well, affective ones, student engagement, mm -hmm. student enjoyment, uh, student self-confidence, transitions in the way students see them see their mathematical identity. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing, um, although we haven't verified this through rigorous uh, quantitative data, we're seeing uh, improvement in student uh, performance on, on external standardized tests. We do have lots of data that indicates that if we get to the fourth toolkit, we're seeing improvements of up to 15% in more than half of the students. But, but these are all, in, from the perspective of building thinking classrooms, those are byproducts. Those yeah. are sort of the positive side mm -hmm. effects. The goal of the framework has really just been to increase student thinking and, and trusting that things like performance, performance achievement and positive self efficacy are, 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 are going to come as a result. With all that thinking, these kids must be pretty tired. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So are there any non-negotiables in a thinking classroom or are there any aspects that you would definitely say? Um, we'll just no, I, I think I know what you're yeah. saying. This idea that, and I think this comes back to an earlier question you asked, which was 
you know, there might be a lot of teachers out there who are saying, well, I have a thinking classroom. And, and I don't want to dispute that. That's not what this is about. One of the mm -hmm. things that happens when you enter research is that you have to pre precisely define your terms. And although I'm not doing that here, there are very precise definitions of what is meant by thinking classroom and what is meant by thinking and so on and so forth. And in a sort of colloquial, uh, everyday language type of way, I'm sure that a lot of teachers would say that they have a thinking classroom. But if we want to talk about a thinking classroom as as defined by this research, right. what are the non-negotiables? Like, what are the things that absolutely have to be there in order for this to be a thinking classroom? Is that, I think that's what yeah, you're Yeah, that's exactly what I was asking. <laughs> um, well, this becomes an important question because with 14 practices, it's easy for us to let go of one or two or yeah. even three and say, well, yeah, no, I'm still mostly doing it. Yeah. And I would agree that there are some things that we can uh, let slip um, all of them contribute to thinking, but they all contribute in different ways and at different magnitudes. So they have different impact factors. But which are the ones that are non-negotiable? So for me, based on the research, the non, one of the big non-negotiables is, is how we use hints and extensions to maintain flow. And I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details about this. Right. But if I had to, if someone told me that building thinking classrooms was trademarked, <laughs> and that I could not use that, I, 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 I would definitely go back and, and probably integrate this into my, into my name, into the name of this framework. Yeah. It would probably be something like building flow in the mathematics classroom <laughs> or something like this. Nice. Because so many of the practices that happen in the first two toolkits are actually vectored. And, and I'm, I'm using this in an active sense, but what I, what I need to, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, are vectored towards making flow possible. And flow appears in the third toolkit. Um, and this is, this is non-negotiable because engagement, student engagement happens when flow is happening and thinking happens when student engagement happens. And without want, without flow, you just can't have thinking. It, it, it's non-negotiable. This is something that we have to work at every day and it requires, it requires more of the teacher than, than mm -hmm. almost anything else we do is their ability to, to really just zero in and, and maintain this flow. And, and I've, wrote, I've written an entire article, <laughs> an entire book chapter on that. Um, and you can find that book chapter on my website. But I want to come back to this idea of vectored. And, and, I, and, and I just want to say that everything about thinking classrooms has emerged out of the data. So the 14 practices emerged out of the data, what the optimal practices for each of these 14 independent variables emerged out of the research and the order we should be implementing emerged out of the research. So it's not quite accurate to say that the first two toolkits are vectored towards flow in a, in a sort of, um, well, Peter says it has to be that way yeah. form. That's not what it is. It's the data says that these practices have to come before that. And it's just my interpretation of that data that indicates that I think the reason those ones come before is because they make, creating flow easier. Right. So that's one of the non-negotiables. Um, and I would say that's the biggest non-negotiable. In my world, all of them are non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that's, I, I would say that's the biggest one. If you were to ask me the question, what is it that teachers have been using this for a long time might want to think back upon or, or start focusing on that they maybe let slip I think my answer would be different. Right. In, in those settings, um, so for example, the other day I was working, um, I, was, I was doing some consulting, and uh, I won't specify where I was, but I was working with a group of teachers who I'd worked with last year as well. Mm -hmm. And um, they had, we were working on the fourth toolkit, so we're moving through this framework and as part of every workshop, we're sort of revisiting and reviewing the other practices through me modeling it, me as the teacher and them as the learners, and they're getting to experience this. And, and one of the teachers in the, in, the, in the debrief from this experience commented to me that there were things that she had forgotten, little right. small moves. Yeah. So for example, one of the results from Thinking Classroom tells us that the problem, a problem is best given in the first five minutes of class. You get more thinking out of, a pro, out of the students on a particular problem 
if you give it in the first five minutes, the longer you wait, the less thinking you get. And it, it just, it deteriorates to zero. Mm -hmm. um, and there's reasons for that that I won't go into. But the data also tells us that it's best if we give this problem verbally. Right. Okay. And again, I'm not going to go into that, but it turns out that that has a huge impact. And I mentioned that earlier. But the third thing the data tells us about when we're giving the problem is where to give it. Mm -hmm. And the data clearly tells us that the students engage more in the problem solving process and, and, and with the thinking. If we give the problem having them stand with us loosely around, around us in some corner of and the room. Pre presumably the back of the room or the side yeah. of the room. Or wherever we can find some floor mm -hmm. space, but certainly not what we consider the front of the room, but it's because there is no front yeah. of the room. But having that sort of loose informal structure when we give the task, the data clearly shows has an impact. So this teacher came to me and what she had been doing was she had been randomizing the kids as soon as they came in and sending them to their, to their stations, to their whiteboards. Yeah. And when they were at the whiteboards, she would then give the problem. Right. And she said to me that she, she had forgotten yeah. this idea that, that giving the problem first, early on in the task, giving it to them while the kids are standing around them close mm -hmm. to you, and then randomizing them and setting them off to the boards was an important sequence. So she had forgotten this. So she, she went away the next day yeah. and she changed this one little thing. <laughs> And she wrote to me later in the day and said it had a big impact. Wow. So it's different from the non-negotiables, but it's, it's about ask, reminding teachers who have been doing this for a while to go back and think about what are the things that they have thought were dispensable. Right. That they can just be, get, get rid of and rethink those and retry them and see what the impact is. Mm -hmm. Because that, there might not have been a very big impact difference early on in their implementation, but now that the students are more used to it, it makes a big difference. We saw this in the data in another way around random groups. So we saw a lot of data where random groups was implemented uh, with fidelity for six weeks. Yeah. And then there was this real, like about 20% of teachers stopped doing it. Right after six weeks and when we interviewed them they said oh yeah well now the kids are working so well it doesn't matter hmm. what was really interesting in the data was at the eight week mark almost all of them brought right. random groups back in right so it's but that's an example of where they themselves realize that oops yeah that, that it makes a difference even when we think it it stopped making a difference so for teachers who have been implementing a long time what are the non-negotiables? Well, the non-negotiable is still flow. But what are the things to think about is to go back and think about what are some of the things that you learned early on that you've stopped doing now that you think that everything yeah. is good? Or sometimes we don't even notice them. I mean, I've come to say at least 20 of, of your sessions and I have loved my own. And I've noticed that every time I watched you do it, I learned something new. Yeah. And I think there was a point in time when you're asking me why I keep coming but it's because I kept seeing new things. Um, and I find when I lead them, I'm intentionally doing all of these things, but only 5% of them are being noticed. So it's interesting that we can walk away from a session thinking, oh, there's this one thing I'm going to implement, but then we sort of uh, lose sight of all of the others. Um, and so what I love about the Building Thinking Classrooms framework is that there's not just these 14 tools, there are also these micro moves that are all attached behind the scenes that we can keep working on. Yeah, and, and that's, and you know, I differentiate between the macro practices and the micro practices. So the macro practices are these 14 yeah. practices, but inside of each one, there's all these micro practices. And when a teacher engages in a workshop, like whether you're leading it or I'm leading it, we're enacting all of these micro practices, yeah. but it's just too much to take in, right? So, and some will come to, the, come to the surface when someone asks a question about it, and others, they, they just can't. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, groups of three was optimal. Right. It's best if every group has one marker, optimal. Yeah. It's best if the task is given in the first five minutes, optimal, right? Like it's, it's all of these things, and, and this is what happens when you run hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of micro experiments you're going to get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of results um, and trying to condense those down 
into something that a teacher can walk away with has been my greatest joy and my greatest challenge. Right. Yeah. So are these micro practices going to be included in your upcoming book? Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So where does someone learn about these micro practices if they cannot come to a workshop? <clears throat> so one, uh, so yeah, well, <laughs> I'm working on the book right now, Building Thinking Classroom. Uh, it's supposed to come out in the fall of 2020, with uh, published by Corwin. Um, I'm really looking forward to it coming out, actually. And it's been a real interesting experience for me to write this because there's so many results. And, and you know, I, I was a high school teacher. Um, I've been a researcher for a very long time. And in the research game, when you write up your results, there's a lot of details that right. researchers care yeah. a lot about that, yeah. that not a lot of teachers care about. So I've had to shed some of that. Uh, we've arrived at this really nice format for each chapter. At least I think it's nice. Um, where in each chapter, so if, if we talk about uh, visibly random groups or we talk about vertical non permanent surfaces or fostering autonomy, it doesn't really matter which one it is. Uh, the chapter starts with a brief introduction, talks about the issue, and the issue is uh, the way this practice looks normally in a, mm -hmm. in, a, in a typical class. The next section is a section called the, the problem, which mm -hmm. is what are some of the negative consequences of it being enacted the way it has typically been enacted? Mm -hmm. And then there's a section called Towards a Thinking Classroom where I lay out some of the results of my research without too much detail about the nitty gritty methodologies um, or even too much narrative about all the hundreds of things we tried <laughs> because we learned so much from all the, the yeah. things we did wrong as well or the things we did not quite as right. And there's a really nice, interesting story about the evolution. But after, after we sort, I, I lay this out, um, there's a section called FAQs, which are the frequently asked questions, which are the questions that you get in the workshops yeah. and I get in the workshops yeah. and that we're addressing some of here. Mm -hmm. um, but these are the questions that typically come up with every practice. And after that, there's a summary. And the summary sort of indicates, well, these are the macro practices that are talked about in this chapter. And these are the micro practices talked about in this chapter. Nice. And it's just a list. But the list sort of draws your attention to these micro practices because they're scattered throughout the chapter. Right. So I just don't have the, the, the runway to go into detail about all of them in the book. So they get embedded within aspects of every chapter. Right. Um, and then at the end, it's sort of signaling saying, hey, these were the micro practices right. that were talked about here. Um, and some of these have been emergent as well yeah, in, in practice. Though. Absolutely. Well, all of them have. Yeah. Right. So, so um, a lot of the, the macro practices emerge from very clear research question. Right. So, for example, every teacher uses group work. Mm -hmm. Okay. The research question is, how can we group students to maximize thinking and engagement? Uh, and that had a very deliberate pursuit. Along the way, we learned all these little things, these little tricks that make it work better. So, for example, uh, we learned that random groups generates more thinking and more engagement than any other form of grouping. But that in itself doesn't make that practice, like that makes it better than those things. But can we optimize? Can we fine tune this now? And then we learned that, yeah, that... Um, the randomizing process, whichever one you use, shouldn't just tell students what group they're in, it should tell them where to go. Right. And we learned that if we, if we add that little micro practice on top of visibly random groups, then it gets even better. But it wasn't really part of our research question per se, it just emerged, as you said, right. out of this. Yeah. yeah. And I would presume that every teacher's classroom would be different. I mean, you and I have sat in a, several and you've sat in many more and what would you say is sort of the nature of um, the range of possibility between the thinking classrooms that you've encountered so uh, well the okay i don't know if i could talk about the range because they all <laughs> look so different and I, I don't know if i could sequence them but but i i, I can say this so the, the building thinking classroom framework is a framework it's the results of 15 16 17 years of research uh, hundreds and hundreds of micro experiments, um, but it's a framework. It it sort of says that if I uh, 
if I do consolidation this way, I get more thinking. But this way is not a replacement for all of the teacherly craft that a teacher has developed right. over and personality and personality that yeah. they developed yeah. over all their years of experience. Like that, it, these practices don't displace right. all of that teacherly craft. What it does is it comes in alongside of that. And because of that teacherly craft is not being displaced, mm. uh, the teacherly craft itself is what uh, allows and actually necessitates every enactment of a, built, of a thinking classroom framework in every classroom to be slightly different. Mm -hmm. So um, a teacher who has spent a lot of time working with technology will use technology, will use yeah. technology within a building thinking classroom in a ubiquitous way. That will look different than someone who, for example, has spent a lot of time prior to implementing this working on assessment. So there's still room for the personality of the teacher and all of their teacherly craft to, mm -hmm. to not only appear within this pedagogy, but it actually shapes this pedagogy. And I, and, and I continue to learn from that, right? This is more things emerge from watching mm -hmm. people and their individual enactments of this. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly room for these things to for this to change I and mean, we look different in every classroom. But, it, but there are some non-negotiables. So for example, if I see um, someone enacting thinking classrooms uh, on Twitter and every student has their own marker, I, 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 yeah, there's, part, there's parts of this that are unique to that teacher, mm. but I also know that, that, that they're, not even, they're not anywhere close to realizing the potential of a thinking classroom because they're still having every student work with their own marker. When, when, you, can, when you collapse that down to every group has a single marker and start to see the affordances that that creates, um, there's more, more can be realized. So, it's, so I'm, I'm not talking about that there's room here for teachers to just dispense with things and still call it the thinking classroom. Yeah. It's, it's not, which ones you choose to enact, it's how you choose to enact them. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of room for personality. And I oh. find uh, myself as a teacher, I've, I've used the, the framework to sort of guide my underlying decisions. But I find the best part about it is that I can become invisible in a classroom and I can kind of pay attention to what's happening and really see into students thinking um, and then make choices in the moment. I find that's the beauty of it for myself. So, so a few weeks, and it's not just yeah. room for every teacher to be different. It's actually room for every teacher to be different in every context. Right. So yeah. I suspect that a teacher who's an acting building thinking classroom, if they're teaching, um, if they're teaching a, a pre-calculus course at yeah. grade 12 level, that they themselves are bringing a different, uh, it, it looks different than if they're teaching it to a grade eight class mm -hmm. or um, a workplace class or a few weeks ago I was teaching some classes mm -hmm. um, in a different city and and the teachers who were observing commented on that not all that not only was I different when I was with the students <laughs> from when I'm in a workshop right I was different when I was with the primary students than when I was with the intermediate <laughs> students right and yeah. um, and yet they all recognized that I was still enacting all of the same things from the thinking classroom framework, but there was, but room. you were adapting. I was adapting and there was room yeah. to flex and, and yeah. so on and so forth. Nice. It's a framework. So in the framework, um, one of the points is on fostering autonomy. Right. And can you say more about this piece and how it emerged and why it's important? Okay. So, uh, fostering autonomy, it was not actually part of our research project. Right. It wasn't yes, an independent exactly. variable to begin mm -hmm. with. And it emerged from observing a whole bunch of teachers teaching the same lesson at the same grade level mm -hmm. uh, in a single day. So they were all teaching their own class, but we had all decided we we're gonna teach the same lesson. And, and watching how radically different the students mm -hmm. behaved. And the, in particular, it, it on the surface, it was how much in some classes the students were standing waiting for the teacher and in other classes, the students were not waiting for the teacher at all. <laughs> so in one class, the students were waiting for the teacher to, to come and give them the next problem or they were waiting for the teacher to come and get some help and they would 
mostly standing with her hand up, but sometimes we were just standing and waiting. <laughs> and then in another class where the teacher was using the exact same tasks, there was no waiting. The students never waited. If they were stuck, they talked to another group or they tried to steal an idea from another board. If, if they were finished, they stole a, a question from another board and got working on that right away. There was no waiting. Um, and in the subsequent interviews with the teachers uh, and hearing that all of the teachers had been explicit with the students that they're allowed to do this, they're allowed to steal tasks, they're allowed to steal ideas, they're allowed to talk to other groups. Mm -hmm. And yet in one class, this was happening much more than any of the mm -hmm. others. And, and digging deeper into that and realizing that, first of all, this student autonomy, the, the way students take care of themselves mm -hmm. in, in a thinking classroom was important, number one. Number two, that telling them that they had the freedom to do that had almost no impact. Mm. And of course, this led to a whole cycle of a bunch of experimentation and thinking and, and, mm -hmm. and exploring. But the realization that simply telling students that they have the freedom to look around mm -hmm. was not enough. Right. It, it, you had to foster this. You had to push them into this space. Mm -hmm. You had to make it a necessity. You had to, you, you had to just force them to seize and enact this autonomy mm -hmm. and how that became so important. And why is this important? Because in a, in a typical class, the teacher controls the pace. They control everything that happens mm -hmm. in the room. But in a thinking classroom, you basically have 10 groups who are all working autonomously and the teacher is able to move around and work with one group at a time, mm -hmm. which means that there's nine groups at any given moment who are working autonomously. And that can either go really well or really bad. And, and fostering autonomy is about how to make that go really well. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the really important practices that allow us, and it sits in the second toolkit and it allows us to make flow happen so much better in the third toolkit. Right. Yeah. So in terms of covering curriculum, right. um, this is a recurring question by many teachers yeah. and uh, adopters of thinking classrooms. And some of, some of them actually mention that they eat through curriculum while others uh, have concern about getting through curriculum. So what advice do you have? Uh, <laughs> so it, more than, okay, first of all, in many ways, I think the nature of a thinking classroom workshop is, is as much at fault of creating mis, misconceptions around thinking right. classrooms as it is around solving them. So um, one of the keys to a thinking classroom workshop is that teachers will experience what a thinking classroom looks like. So mm -hmm. the facilitator, whether it's you or me or somebody else, will typically have the teachers working through tasks and they will be working through tasks in the same way students will be working through tasks in the thinking classroom and the teacher will be facilitating <laughs> this in the same way and when you do this with teachers it's really hard to come in and to, and decide that we're gonna we're gonna start this workshop with a really good long division question <laughs> or a really exciting right. completing the square question yep. right like these these are not the questions that are going to allow us to model this because whereas students, this is, these are thinking tasks for teachers who know this content, this, this is nothing interesting. So we have to use tasks that are foreign, unfamiliar to the teachers. And so we tend to use these sort of highly engaging non-curricular tasks. And then what, what comes out of that is this misconception that thinking classrooms is all about non-curricular tasks, right. these highly yes. engaged, which then lets us think that, well, these obviously are the things that we do on bonus days, on Fridays, yeah. on the day before the long weekend, just yeah. week before Christmas. Just and another strategy to add in. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or something we do as a warm-up, mm -hmm. right, uh, in that first 15 minutes, 10 minutes of class. And that's not what Thinking Classrooms is about at all. Mm -hmm. Thinking Classrooms is about... it's the not culture. About, it's about the culture. Yeah. It's not about finding thinking tasks it's about building thinking classrooms it's about it's about getting students to think individually and collaboratively and then pointing that thinking at anything that right. comes from mathematics curriculum so and once we have built that culture as you call it and and the students are thinking mm -hmm. and and we point that beast of a thinking classroom at curriculum they just tear through content. Yeah. So one of my favorite stories is when uh, when we did that lesson in Vernon yeah. and uh, and I took a group of grade five students through the entire grade eight algebra curriculum yeah. in 35 minutes. 
or when we teach a lesson in a grade 10 classroom we take a class through the entire factor and quadratics unit in yeah. an hour or completing the square in an hour and it's and and of course this is not possible if unless most of these practices are in place you can't do this on day one mm -hmm. um but thinking classroom like once when students are not thinking almost everything we teach is difficult right <laughs> it it just takes us forever ever to teach a concept and there's so many nuances and then there's a testing and then the retesting and still we're not necessarily happy with the performance yeah. of the students and yet when they're thinking almost anything is possible and then these class mm -hmm. students are tearing through content so why is it that it takes us three weeks to teach a group of grade eights a <laughs> class of grade eights one and two step solving algebra equations and i did it on a last block on a friday in june <laughs> in vernon in 35 minutes, right? right? With grade fives. So it's it's because they were thinking. They were thinking yeah. class. And, and I just gave them something to think about in highly structured, incrementally more challenging ways that allowed me to, to initiate and maintain flow throughout the entire experience. Mm -hmm. And part of that has to do saying less at the beginning. <sighs> we have such a strong tendency to try to say so much at the beginning but I've been working with some future teachers recently and they've been really noticing, they, they recently did some, some of their own leads and they noticed the differences between all 10 of them, um, just between how they um, gave the important information and didn't give too much. As soon as they gave too much, they had all the hands in the air asking them all the questions. Yeah. So it was really interesting to just pay attention to keeping one thing still and then just making a few changes and noticing in your students what, what ends up happening. Right, and that holding one thing still and changing, mm -hmm. that's, that comes from variation mm -hmm. theory, and you know variation theory very well, and the listener can go and look that up <laughs> if they wish. It's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's so exciting. Yeah. Um, but, but you're right, like one of the things that happens in these settings, when, when we teach in a typical way, what we're trying to do is prepare the students to answer their last homework question. Right. So how much do I have to say at the beginning of a lesson mm -hmm. so that when I stop talking, <laughs> they can now independently go and answer 10 homework questions right. yeah. from section A, B, and C. Yeah. And that, that takes a lot of runway. Mm -hmm. But what if my goal is only to say enough to get them to be able to answer the first question? Mm -hmm. and, and then they learn something from that first, and from, from figuring out that first question. And then I ask them to solve the second question and they learn something from that. And then I, I'm still there. I can still talk to them and, and I can, but, but it's a very different way of introducing a topic is if all we're concerned with is what do I need to say so that they, they're ready to solve the first question rather than the last question. Right. That's a very nice framing. Um, it almost sounds like we need to trust our students <laughs> to, to be able to, to move forward. So would you say that this is part of uh, the definition of, of how you can tell if you've achieved a thinking classroom? That you can have students you know, moving through um, with as little information as possible, um, but with the support to, to sort of gain a deeper understanding on their own? Uh, absolutely. This is, this, is, this is actually what it is we want to achieve. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that we can't start every topic right. with just a question. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that almost all of the topics can be started that way. Mm -hmm. So it has to do with how we pose the question and how we tap into prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, because the prior knowledge is there. And, and when we teach in, in, a, in a typical classroom where the students work as individuals, the challenge is that right. if an individual is lacking the prior knowledge, they're not able to do yeah. the task we're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. But when we, when we make this a collective, when we put them in groups of three, now, now the diversity of their knowledge is probably going to, their collective knowledge is right. going to probably be enough to answer the question. And if it's not, the, the autonomy the that we around found, the room. Right. They can look across the room. And, and many times I actually find students will get back into a task or get a hint or extension from a neighboring board. Yeah. Um, so it's and, and so very self-sustaining. Yeah, you called it mobility of knowledge, and this is what we call it, knowledge mobility. Is this, and this comes, this is important with the fostering autonomy because it's, when right. the autonomy is there, then the knowledge can move, 
Right. And, and so, if they're just standing there. Right. <laughs> waiting for someone to come over then. Right. So if, if a group is lacking the prerequisite knowledge, they can get it from somewhere else in the room. And then all of a sudden, I can ask a different question. So when I have to trust that every individual has the knowledge, it's hard to trust that. Right. And which leads to a lot of preamble. Mm -hmm. But if I can trust that the knowledge exists within the room, and that knowledge can be mobilized within the room, then I can pose a different question without as much preamble. Right. And, and if you remember, we, we, I was teaching that one lesson and we had given the... Right, I think it was the prisoner problem. No, I, it was, no? The, pi it was the, the treasure island problem. Oh, the problem. treasure island problem. Very good problem. Yeah. But it requires a certain visualization. Right. So it was, so we had all these groups working on this and they had been grinding away at this <laughs> for like 20, 25 yeah. minutes and making yeah. very little progress. But there was a lot of perseverance because the culture had already been built and and they were really going at this and they, they were frustrated, but not in an uncomfortable way. They yeah. were just really pushing. And, and then I went and worked briefly with one group and just kind of dropped the hint. Yeah. And then, that no one else noticed. That no one else, <laughs> no one else had tried that yeah. approach. And then we stood back to watch how long it took for that it one idea yeah. <laughs> to move around the room. And I think it was 20 seconds. Oh, I think it was quicker than that. I think we were literally staring at a whiteboard of about four or five teams of three and, and the visualization just shot across the room within yeah, seconds. Yeah, seconds. Incredible. Yeah. For sure. So that knowledge mobility is, yeah. it becomes a powerful thing in the classroom. So when we approach classrooms of, as students working as individuals, it's very different the way we, we mm -hmm. think about what is possible. Right. But when we think about the classroom as a complex organism with collective knowledge mm -hmm. and that that knowledge has legs yeah. and can move around the room sometimes at lightning speed and that the students are going to take care themselves to move that knowledge around, yeah. then so much more is possible. Mm -hmm. and, and it fundamentally changes the way we think about how to plan for a lesson. For sure. Well, we mm -hmm. want to think about things like, is, is our initial task e accessible enough for everyone? Yeah. Or if it's too difficult, then it kind of stifles yeah. everything, and then you have to recover. Yeah, um, which is harder to do. It's very hard to do. Because if the initial task is too easy, the biggest consequence is we just got to move fast to get the next one. Yeah. But backtracking is much harder. Yeah. Um, any but, tips for that for teachers who? Yeah, you, you can never start too easy. Just start with. <laughs> Just a, start as easy as possible. As easy as possible. Yeah. Make the question beyond trivial. Let the students move. And what happens is, before long, the students are actually they're tearing through that one, yeah. and then they're making their own next question for because sure. they, they see had, yeah. right away which direction this is going. In. Yeah. Sometimes they jump ahead too far and, and they miss <laughs> some things, and you got to back them up. But it's. But it's not just that planning. It's also, what am I going to say? Right. Because everything I say before they start has a potential of robbing them of an opportunity to think. For sure. And that's, that's a different way of thinking mm -hmm. from when we're thinking about what is all the knowledge I have to put into their heads ahead before of time. Before they can use it. Yeah. 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 So they get to build it. So we've talked about the collective space yeah. and in your framework, you also have tools for vectoring that collective knowledge towards individual knowledge. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So I, th I feel like that's a really important piece. It is an important piece. You're always at the collective level. Then you kind of question what the individuals are going to be doing on their yeah. own as well afterwards. Right. And that collective space, when they're working at the boards collectively, there's a lot of synergy. Mm -hmm. And, and to say that it's, it's greater than the sum of the parts yeah. is, is an understatement. For like, sure. Like these yeah. groups are achieving unbelievable yeah. things. And, and I remember you and I were in a class in Ottawa where we watched. There was, a, there was an odd number of students in the room. So there was this one pair of students. Right. And they were, they were not the strongest student in the class. And they started very tentatively. Yeah. It was a boy and a girl. And they were, there was a lot of a politeness and tentativeness at the beginning yeah. and 
and it took them a long time to do the first question yeah. and to and then it took them even longer to do the second mm -hmm. and 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 they weren't quite confident and then all of a sudden we blink and they were even with every other group in the yeah. room yeah. and it was just amazing to watch how how that synergy mm -hmm. within that group gained momentum and then took off right which is and, something for consolidation as well oh, and yeah, for the yeah. teacher if they yes. notice that yeah but does that mean that if they then go and sit down, each member of that pair right. has the same individual understanding of what they were able to achieve collectively? And it turns out the answer is no, <laughs> right? Like in some cases, some of the students will have that. Mm -hmm. and in, but, but that space is so synergistic. And to say that they don't have the same individual understanding is not quite the right framing either. Right. Because they were part of that. So obviously... And not just part of it as spectators, but they were agents in this. They yeah. were driving this conversation. They were participating fully. They were contributing and they were mm -hmm. solving and they were achieving along mm -hmm. with every other member of the group. But it was, it was a piling on. Right. It wasn't the intersection mm -hmm. of the set that achieved this. It was the union of the set. And they both had access right. into in, what they were doing. And into each other and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But how do we take that collective uh, phenomenon? Mm -hmm. which it is, mm -hmm. and transfer it into a, a more reified individual understanding and capacity. Right. So that the individuals now have the possibility to act in different contexts. Right. And, and, and basically, how do, the, how do we take that collective ability mm -hmm. and move it so that each individual has full access to that co what was previously only yeah. a collective ability. Yeah. And I think that's more of an accurate description of what it is that needs to happen. And when we, when we don't do that, what we see is there's, there's a diffusion mm -hmm. as, as they go back to being individuals. Yeah. And what we really wanted to understand better was how do we, how do we move that from that collective synergy to that individual, right. having the, invi the individual having the same collective mm -hmm. understanding. Well, it turns out we already have some of these practices, right? Yeah. Right. So one is practice or homework, like that. That that's primarily the purpose of yeah. of this is to. It's although it, those were unuseful metaphors, and we we did some rebranding, and it turns out that when we shift the meaning of this experience to checking their understanding, mm -hmm. it had a more impactful result, and they started to think and they engaged with it differently. So. So we move them from the boards and we, we, the first thing we do is we sit them down and we actually have them do what we call meaningful notes or notes to my future dumb mm -hmm. self. So what do you have to write down now so that in three weeks you can remember yeah. what, what you now know from the collective, mm -hmm. from what was achieved within the collective? Um, that's the first part of the reifying experience. And in many ways, that's really just an individual interpretation of what happens as a collective consolidation. So if I had to, if I had to do this chronologically, mm -hmm. right, introduce a task, get them on the boards, synergy, flow, all of this is happening. Then we have a consolidation, which is a collective, the teachers mm -hmm. leading this collective consolidation where we're, they're pulling in all of the ideas that were learned and reifying them. At, and walking them through from the yeah. basics as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now the student has to sit down and, make sense of that consolidation mm -hmm. and that's what they do in the, these meaningful notes they write down what they take from it what mm -hmm. what what do i have to write down now so that i can remember this and that's a that's the first step in that reifying we've program. seen some scaffolding around that oh, as yeah. well yeah. some teachers will provide a little template for students to uh yeah add things into and others just let them go at it yeah um, so that's been very interesting to watch and it's and on that note, it's really interesting because grade four students are really good at doing yeah. it without scaffolding. <laughs> uh, grade 12 students need to be able to do it without scaffolding. But in the middle, <laughs> they can't do it without scaffolding, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so the scaffolding ha is there for them. Um, after that, we give them some check your understanding questions. And these are really, okay, so now what can you do as an individual? You've, you've had an experience to experience this as a collective. We discussed it in the consolidation. You had a chance to write some notes to your future dumber self to reify this. Now let's check them. Let's mm -hmm. see where is your understanding of this. And that's what the check your understanding questions are for, which 
ironically, students often do. They end up going on the whiteboards, yes. or a few of them will, because yes. you give them the autonomy to choose. Yeah. And for, for me in my classroom, I'll have four or five go up on the boards, and the, the other ones are actually watching them. Yeah. Um, so, and then they value that. that yeah. you know, they're but the conversations are very different from yeah. when they're, they're... They're in the thinking space. Yes. Yeah. So for here, sure. it's more of a... It really is about checking their understanding. Mm -hmm. And you hear things like, no, I don't understand it. Yeah. Or give me another one. Let me see right. if I they can... They feel safe. Yeah. And it really is. Uh, and I think that's a really nice bridge between that collective synergy and that individual yeah. uh, understanding is that autonomously chosen pairings. It's often pairings mm -hmm. in this space. Yeah. So that's part of this reifying process. We move from the synergy through three stages. Consolidation, meaningful notes, check your understanding questions. Mm -hmm. And then there's a fourth one that happens in the fourth toolkit, which is a, which is a self-assessment one, mm -hmm. which, uh, where they can actually check to see what they know and what they don't know. Right. Yeah. Nice. And in terms of timing and block uh, orders, I mean, sometimes we have 50 minute blocks right. or hour and 20 minute blocks. What's a, a tip you have for people who are trying this? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. so you always start with a, a brief introduction of the task. You have mm -hmm. five minutes to get them on the boards and thinking. And, and if you have to give them a little bit of an introduction to something, well, what do you, what's the minimum thing you're going to say? Yeah, because in that five sure. minutes, yeah. you gotta, you gotta inject a bit of knowledge and tell them what the task is, <laughs> right? It's not a lot of time. And then you got to get them up on the boards and working. And, um, so that happens. And then we enter that flow phase where they're in that synergy, synergistic group, um, where the collective understanding is happening and they're, they're mobilizing the knowledge and using their autonomy to do so. And, and the teacher's working like mad to maintain that flow <laughs> yeah. using hints and extensions. And it's, it's an unbelievable phase of the lesson. It's, I call it work in the room. Yeah. Right. And it's, and it's, it's my favorite part of it watching, yeah. uh, what is achievable within that space. And that space, that, that, that time that you spend in flow where the students are actually on the boards working in these random groups is, is highly variable. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's determined a lot less by where you are in your mm -hmm. in your planning on the bell schedule. It has much more to do with the energy that's in the room, because there comes a point mm -hmm. where the students have just run out of gas yeah. and like you can keep pushing them. But you're, it's diminishing returns now. What you get <laughs> back from your effort to keep them working becomes less and less and less. And we've talked about the metaphor of, of it's like kind of like surfing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the wave is broken. And, and to be honest, whatever's happening in there is more valuable than anything that happens before or after it. Mm -hmm. So if all of it, if the students are staying in that zone the whole period, let them go. You can clean up the next period. Yeah, totally. But it's, but really, there's not much I can say as a teacher before or after this happens that, that, even compares to the learning that happens in that space. Um, then we do the consolidation, which depending on the complexity of the topic takes anywhere from five to 10 minutes. Give them some time to write meaningful notes. Some teachers assign meaningful notes as homework. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, these are for you. You do them on your own time. And likewise with the check your understanding questions. These are for you. You do them on your own time. Mm -hmm. We don't use the word homework, but it's, and some teachers do that. And if you have enough time in class, that's when you do it, or at least you start doing it there. Um, if the lessons are, the blocks are shorter, then we get them into flow and maybe they'll go the whole class. And then the next class, we get them back into flow for a short period of time and then yeah. take care of this reifying process where we transition from the group right. collective knowing down to the individual understanding through consolidation, uh, meaningful notes and check your understanding mm -hmm. question. And you've made a very nice diagram of this, right? Now you use we it. Have. We have. Yeah. So is there a most powerful tool in the toolkit? Uh, there's two. Okay. The, the, well, okay. So uh, let's... <laughs> so which is the one that I would never give up? Random groups. Random groups has more impact on the social culture in the room than any other of the practices. I would never, ever give it up. If someone came to me and said, you have to have 13. Yeah. Or... or our framework can only tolerate 13. That's the last one I would, would drop. Um, what's the one that allows us to get through the most content? Flow. Gets, that's the one where we start eating through content. Um, which is the one 
where we, we actually start to really solidify ideas, consolidation. Which is the one that has the biggest impact on student performance is assessment as communication, where we help students understand where they are and where they're going. So powerful is sort of an ambiguous <laughs> term, but, but, and what's really interesting in what I just said is that these, these really powerful practices are spread out through the framework. Yeah. Random groups is in the first, flow and, and consolidation is in the third, the assessments, communications in the fourth. So you can really just get better as you go. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's your biggest takeaway from all this work? Uh, okay, so there's many. <laughs> uh, from a purely selfish takeaway is I think what I've loved the most is that I'm getting results. But more than that is I'm getting the results before I have explanations, mm. right? Like, like we, we learn so much about what works and we have no way to un, of understanding why. Yeah. And we're still, we're still trying to understand why if I give a task verbally, right. it's much more impactful than if I give it textually. I have some theories, but it's just like full explanation is tough. Right. We don't know yet. And I think selfishly that's made this very interesting for me is, mm -hmm. is finding these results. And, and these are verifiable, reproducible, mm -hmm. transferable results and having no clue why <laughs> this, is, this is the case. So that's, that's been really interesting. And that's, that's not just each of the 14 practices. It's also the sequence of implementation in mm -hmm. these four toolkits. Like why right. is that the sequence? Yeah. And trying to understand that. Um, I think... For teachers, the biggest takeaway is this. If you believe that thinking is a necessary precursor to learning, and if thinking is something that you want to improve at in your classroom, it turns out that there are things that you can do that actually make that happen. This, we don't have to leave it up to chance or the particular demographic of the students that you get that year. We don't have to leave it up to what the teacher the year before did, that we could take pretty much any collection of students and by implementing these practices that we, we can actually make this happen. And, and there's not a lot of things in education that we can say that about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's the big takeaway. The other big takeaway is that I tore down classroom practice and built it back up with the goal of thinking. Mm -hmm. I, lately I've been thinking a lot about well that, that turned out to be my particular interest what if someone had a different interest mm -hmm. what if we tore down a typical lesson around these 14 practices and not the thinking classroom practice but the the 14 practices that every teacher does right With how the, they group students yeah. what the student workspace is uh the how they answer questions what if we tore each of those practices down and built it up with a different focus what if we built mm -hmm. it up with a focus on equity mm -hmm or indigeneity, or what if we built it back up uh, with a focus on uh, self-efficacy? Right. What would the practices look like? And I think this is, there's a world of possibility yet mm -hmm. to be explored out there. This idea that what happens, what, what happens to classrooms when we don't assume that the way things have always been or the way they have to continue to be, mm -hmm. and we're willing to break the institutional norms, for a more noble purpose and what what is it that emerges out of that wonderful i think it's an exciting space very exciting well thank you so much and thank you yeah i think this was uh much more interesting <laughs> listening to me go through hopefully a it is stack. for our listeners and uh we look forward to connecting with anyone who has further yeah. questions and we were sort of all over the place going from novice users to deeper and more sophisticated users and I think that for someone who's just coming into this, listening to this talk <laughs> more than once might be useful, but not more than once in a row, but listening to it at the beginning and then implementing for a while and then listening to it again. Yeah. And there's more to, more to learn as, as you are learning. Yeah. Definitely, if this is your first time hearing about building thinking classrooms, you should check out some of the other uh, introductory resources so that you'll have a sense of what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you.